What is going on guys? It's me Troy and I'm here again with another video and today I'm going to be talking about my reading of Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister. Um, three Women at the Heart of 20th Century China by author Zhong Shang. Here are the three sisters here. This is the eldest sister, Ai Ling. The middle one is Shi Ling and the other one, the little sister, is Mei Ling. So it's Big Sister, Red Sister and then uh, little sister. But anyway, this author, as you guys know, she's the author behind the autobiography. There she is there. But anyway, Shang is the 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 author of the autobi her autobiography, Wild Swans, which is an incredibly amazing book, which I do, and I don't like to use the word recommend, but if you want something like a really good autobiography based around the history of China and people's individual personal families experiences during specifically the Cultural Revolution, then that is a plus 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 book to read. Anyway, love that book, read it years ago, and I think I could, it's probably due for a rereading. If I was a rereader type of person, I would reread it now, but yeah, I ain't a rereader type of person, unfortunately. Anyway, with that being said, Shane has an entire body of work addressing China's history. If you read her work in a chronological fashion as it pertains to her address in China's history, the first book you would probably pick up with would be The Emperor's Dowager Qi Shi, as that addresses the Manchurian era dynasty on into the early 20th century. And then her other book, on the other end, you will read Mao, The Unknown Story, which of course addresses uh, Mao, the Russia, Stalin, Communist China, and most devastatingly, the Cultural Revolution. But for the first time, she's actually going to spend an individual book talking about a much more, well not much more, but a really interesting period of China, which is between the Manchurian Dynasty and Mao's rule. And I always think of this particular period sort of like, China really struggling for its political identity. And I say that because Empress Dowager Qi Shi left China on a pretty decent note, if you will. I mean, you know, there are some machinations and things like that and all of that. But she left China on a pretty decent note because China has always been a very closed off country. So through her, she ushered China into like the modern era. You know, China started to be receive influences from rest Western cultures to the point where before the end of the Manchurian dynasty, you know, China was moving much more towards a democracy. So we're looking at them opening themselves up to different forms of art, different forms of architecture, you know, ports, imports, all those amazing things that connected China to various other countries and Western influence. Unfortunately, people, some people still, some at that time still did not agree with that. They did not agree with China ushering in a democracy, you know, where the people, the citizens had a voice, essentially. And there were a slew, or we'll say one in specific, a generalissimo, or a warlord named Sun Yat-sen, who wanted to push China from a democracy and make it much more of a, a republic. So within many of his connections, he decided to form his own military, his own army, and to strategize a different number of coups to take care of the president of China post Tishi's passing. Uh, this did not necessarily work out in his favor and he really spent the majority of his years trying to exact that form of thought. Anyway, keep him in mind. So, Sun had some opposition later on. Another generalissimo or warlord named Chiang Kai-shek he wanted China to be to move much more towards being a nationalist nation. But anyway, that's why I love this book because for the first time, Shang really goes deep into addressing, like I said, that period in China's political history from the end of the Manchurian era all the way, you know, to you know the Mao era. But it's that 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 bracket in between that I really appreciate about this book. And she addresses it, and there was no other way, I don't think, that she could have not addressed it through the lens of the three Song Sisters. That's S-O-O-E-N-G. So, if I said it wrong, I said it wrong, but the Song Sisters. Now, the Song Sisters, they come from a family where their father was like a dejected preacher, a dejected pastor, um, who never really got his ride in, ride in life, but to his benefit and to their benefit, he was very well connected to a lot of political forces in China's political arena. But nonetheless, they all 
receive their education primarily in America as they were a part of many of the scholarship programs that Empress Dowager Qi Shi has set up for many of China's students, children, students, etc., etc. You know, she set up these scholarship programs for China's youth to go out into the Western world to learn about arts and mathematics and architecture and engineering and to bring all those things back into China, you know, to fuel China's hope. But nonetheless, from from top to bottom, Eileen ended up marrying a accountant. Xingling ended up marrying uh, the warlord or generalissimo uh, <laughs> Sun Yat-sen. And as I said, Sun was mush pushing China to become a republic. And Mei-ling ended up marrying Chiang Yat-sen, who, as I said, was pushing China to become a nationalist country. Now, between the three of them, and as history progressed, the oldest sister, Eileen, and the youngest sister, Mei-ling, ended up siding with China becoming a nationalist nation. It was the middle sister, uh, Xingling, who is known as the Red Sister, who got into the political arena of China becoming a republic, which, with the influence of Russia, became a communist China, even at the death of her husband. So she ended up being the one who became Mao's chairman eventually. So I love this book because, you know, the author managed to tell China's history, political history, in this time through looking at the two, the booking sisters, the eldest sister as well as the youngest sister, in opposition of their middle sister, who was riding with communist China. So that's, it's, it's just, I just love the way that, and I don't think it would have been hard to have not included, it was impossibly hard to have not included these guys. Because I tried to read another book on this particular history in China's world and it, I, I really needed to know it through these these women specifically do their life story and the reason that I'm saying that I like how she told the story of she addressed this particular time in China's history through these women characters through these prolific characters is because it's so accessible I just love how this author has always been able to just I love that her writing is, is both it has brevity to it it's brisk it is clip but it's also very heavy with its storytelling and I like Shang's work when it comes to addressing China's histories because it's not so much elaboration as it is to just kind of facts you know she of course annotates everything but the point is that there's no exaggerating and elaborating of scenes you know is either <laughs> you know you know how some authors like they write these nonfiction works and they get like a whole sheet of dialogue as, as if they were like present no nah, Shane doesn't do all that she just moves on to the, the facts and information but anyway big sister red sister little sister I absolutely freaking loved it I just cannot stand the fact that I had to wait six or seven years for her to release her next book I want them to come out all the time Anyway, that's one of the books that I wrapped up reading nonfiction over with. And with that being said, I'm going to see y'all later.